a welcome. Let me introduce you. Um, the people here on the panel, um, from left to right, Andrea Benson uh, Otmar, producer, uh, Herbert Nordrum. At, uh, you, can you maybe, yeah, so can people uh, recognize you? Who plays Ivan in, in the film, of course. Without the mask, he's more easily recognizable. Renate Reinswer, uh, who plays, of course, Julie. Joachim Trier, the film's director. Uh, Anders Danielsen Lee, that you already know if you're familiar with uh, Joachim Trier's cinema. And uh, Eskil Vogt, who has been a co writer of all of Joachim Trier's movies. Uh, so to date, uh, I think there is a, a question there. Can you please stand up, please, and introduce yourself? Bonjour, Frédéric Rougeau, Le Mac Cinéma. Hello. I'll be putting my question in uh, French. Le film, il est the film contemporain. is feminist, uh, uh, very contemporary, écrit par des hommes, du coup, and written by men. Vous écrit. How did you Some write this for it to sound true from a psychological stance in particular? Yeah, I'll, I'll th thank you for the question. I, it's a relevant question, I guess, you know. Um, there's something very liberating about writing characters that are not necessarily yourself. You're allowed to draw from people you know and love, imagination, and you can also put a lot of yourself in there to try to empathize with the characters. And I think the question of, of writing a female character, um, I felt it was kind of liberating, you know? It's, it's interesting because when, when we made the, the first film, Reprise, together 15 years ago, uh, we were making films about men who were vulnerable and were crying and were emotional and everyone was asking, like, you know, a lot of people thought that was kind of weird. And, and I think that liberation for both or all genders uh, to be allowed to be complex and emotional, you know, and, and for us that create characters, I think it's all about the human essence of the character more than I think about only gender. But it's, it was fun. And I think Renata did a lot of interesting work on the script when we had finished the first draft, you gave us some good feedback and you actually pushed a lot of things. I don't know if you want to add something about the collaboration, perhaps. Yeah, uh, I felt it was very important to you that you were very nervous. Uh, when I <laughs> read the script for the first time, you were like tripping after. Oh, right. Uh, uh, but I was very surprised and very happy that you so accurately portrayed a woman of my age. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was. Uh, but I think there was some things that uh, I brought in that wasn't in the script in the fight scene that was quite, uh, I feel was important for the project. But um, yeah, you were very open to, it was very important to you, yeah. We actually wrote the script with, uh, with uh, Renate in mind for the main role. Uh, so we had like a guiding star in that respect. And uh, also when we write Joachim now, we don't think about gender or like, that's not the, the point. The point is the character and their psychology and making it true for them in the moment. That's what counts for us, you know? So, and of course we like to talk to people and that's part of our process is to like be like a sponge of everyone around us and everyone we know of all genders, of course, uh, and, and we try to, to put that in the movie, and that's, uh, that's what we did this time as well. Um, was there a particular challenge uh, with the fact that you portray this character in various ages, in various stages of her life? So it, we're not sure there are some clues, but we're not sure exactly how many years separate each. Um, mm. so, for the actors, the actor, actress, and the, and the writers, was there a lot of talk about this and the different looks of the character? Also? Yeah, it was. Uh, we talked a lot about the physicality of the character. Mm. That uh, early, she needed to be more restless, and then when, uh, thank you, when she um, uh, kind of settles and uh, accepts her life as it is. 
uh, in all its flaws, she's more calm and uh, in place with herself. We talked about that. That was important change for her. Absolutely. And I mean, I think, you know, what we discovered, Eskil and I also writing it initially, is that there was a sort of great existential potential in talking about the development of one's approach to love and, 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 and Julie's approach to accepting and loving herself as well, to be able to get close uh, to someone. I, I remember it's probably in the year-long conversation, you know, if we were sitting and discussing scripts for 15 years now, I skill or more, actually. And we know each other very well, um, privately. We're very good friends. We, we uh, you know, whenever anyone of us has gone through something or I've gone through one of my many breakups, I've shared my grief with you <laughs> or my experience of, oh, how difficult this is. And I remember we had this idea about, um, we brought up in cinema a lot of the time to think that love is about essence. This idea that you meet someone, the right one, that something exterior of yourself will release you into finding love, as if it's some sort of hidden treasure. Um, but I also think that time plays into it, you know? And it's a theme that Eskild and I have explored in, in, in all our films, the, the damn thing, that if you meet someone at the wrong time, or if time passes in the wrong way in terms of how you want to approach your life, you know, that, that could be very dramatic. And I think in this case, the film is a lot about bad timing. So to follow a character over so many years and see her development, I thought, gave a, um, a larger scope for that thematic treatment, hopefully. Yeah, we really wanted the movie to be very free in its form and just be a sequence of small moments at times that seem almost insignificant. And then at one point, the character realizes that, oh, that, that was my life, you know? That, that was the, the important relationships of my youth and that was uh, the choices I made while I was thinking, while I thought I had all the time, and I still had all those choices ahead of me. So that, that's the, uh, the, the feel of time passing in the movie was very important to us, and, and uh, so, so the question is very pertinent about that. It, the, the amount of years is not that important, but the feel of like life lived was what we really tried to, uh, to, uh, to have come across in the film. Uh, before we, uh, just before the next qu question, I'd like to ask who came up with the title? Because in France, the, the French title is Julie et en douze chapitres, which is Julie in 12 chapters. But the original title, in fact, means the worst person in the world. So who came up with this? Uh, first, in the first draft, it was a chapter heading. And then we say, hey, what, couldn't this be a good title? It was, uh, so it came a little bit late in the process. But uh, yeah, Norwegians yeah. are amazing at self-deprecation. Yeah. You know, it's like a national sport. <laughs> so we thought that would be a popular title. Yeah, yeah. To hate yeah. oneself, you know, that's a way to sell a love story. Yeah. So. It, it's, the, it's the idea, I guess, of like everyone we know in Norway says at one point, oh, I'm the worst person in the world. It's like the feeling like you privately failed because you have so many opportunities. You live in a rich country, you have everything at hand, and then you just don't manage to live up to expectations, your own expectations. I mean, people don't judge you on it, you know, you feel it. So, so that's, I guess, that's what we talked about when we thought, well, that's a, that's a catchy title, isn't it? And, uh, and we, uh, we like the meaning of it. Yeah. Hi, my name is Lauren Devine, I'm Cinegirl magazine in the UK. Um, thank you, Joaquim, for giving us an ending with a female that doesn't end up with a man. You know, she kind of learns to become, she ends up with neither. You know, she has all these inner conflicts and many, many versions of herself, which were extremely relatable and entertaining to watch, so thank you. Um, right now to my question, I suppose, is how much of your own self did you see in Yulia and how much of it was difficult for you to kind of enter into and portray? Because she is so many different people and she changes so much and like she pursues so many different routes and never kind of realizes a lot of them but like that's literally all of us so i was just wondering how much of that did you see in yourself yeah a lot yeah um it was uh when My... i first oh sorry <laughs> when i first read it it was um yeah i was very moved by yeah i already said that but the way it a woman was portrayed i felt very close to the character and it, during the process, I would like 
try out different ways of doing her more like this or like this, but I always ended up doing it more like we just analyzed and talked about the uh, scene and then just lived it kind of. Yeah, I wanted it, really wanted it to have all the nuances of some universal, yeah, like every, that everyone can relate to. And that's the biggest compliment for that character. Yeah. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Yeah. Did you have uh, Renata in mind when you were writing the first draft? Uh, if you had an actor in mind? Yeah. It, it, yeah, 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 we knew. Yeah, that was, was one so, of the premises. I'll tell you a quick story. So, Renate was in Oslo August 31st. She has one line of dialogue. It was her first film. You were just out of theater school. It's like, let's go to the party. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was her line. So, uh, but because we Who were... Who it? It's amazing. It's yeah. a great... It was... I, I never worked better. That was <laughs> that, top of peaked. my career. <laughs> So what happened was we were obsessed with shooting particular scenes where Renata was biking around and it was early morning light that lasts for like 30 minutes. And we got to sustain it through a whole sequence. So you were on set nine days yeah. for that one line, just to have the right. We shot half an hour, you had to go home. We shot half an hour, you had to go home. So after nine days of shooting with you, I thought, damn, like you're really, really great to work with. You're really talented. And I watched your career. You've done a lot of great theater. I remember a Bob Wilson play where uh, the incredible Isabel Luper came to Oslo to watch it because she's a friend of Bob's. And, and uh, she came to me and she said, there's this one great actress that I saw in, and she had a purple dress. And, the other, and then I met you and you were like, oh, I wore this purple dress. You know, it was you. So a lot of people were very intrigued and, and, and fascinated with your theater work, but you hadn't done a, a lead in a feature film. So I was lucky enough to have you do that. You know, I'm happy you accepted. <laughs> I'm happy. Yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Leila from The Independent. First of all, congratulations for such a great film. I think the people welcomed it with a really warm heart. And that leads me to the question that um, this was written by two men. And uh, it's quite surprising because many women in the room, I mean, a lot of people were crying and laughing crying as if they were going through a breakup during the screening. And um, we all wondered afterwards how come men wrote um, a story that felt very womanly. It felt as if we are, you were in the skin of a woman. And that's quite rare to come across because it really didn't feel like a man perspective. Um, so that's the first question. And then the second question was for the for the actors, how was it to be directed by Joaquin? Because it, it just felt so sincere and just, and nothing was too much or not enough. Um, so I, I guess this is also quite rare. So for the actors afterwards, please. Thank you, thank you very much for your compliments. Um, this whole discussion of, of, of writing uh, a woman being a man, it, it, to be honest, we, I, I, it, it doesn't feel strange or uh, like we said earlier. I, 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 I grew up in a in a, um, kind of a you know in the in the seventies and eighties. My childhood, I came from a family of, where my mother was a very strong woman, a feminist who made uh, documentaries amongst other places in Africa and Zimbabwe about women's rights and you know. Uh, so, so I, I realize I have a lot of shame, and I get very shy sometimes to say the wrong thing, you know, because I, I, I know, I understand uh, uh, that whole discourse, which, which we keep going through again and again in different uh, alterations, you know, and uh, all I can say about writing, I mean, a lot of the filmmakers that I've, uh, uh, that, that we've all probably grown up loving, you know, people like Bergman or... Antonioni, you know, they, they often had female leads and it, it just felt like good cinema to me. So I, I, I grew up thinking that that was a natural thing that could occur. I mean, people were hassling us before because we made a very sort of boy group film in the first film and then the second film with Anders. It was also a very much a male perspective and all that. It's, we, we tell what we can. I don't have that much control, to be honest. You know, we try to be truthful. I, so, so if it works, Great, you know. Thank you very much. Very happy it works. Uh, yeah. That people recognize themselves in the characters. That's the that's the highest compliment for this kind Absolutely. of movie. I mean, so. we're so happy to hear that. And uh, I just uh, need to just reiterate that we don't 
we don't say, oh, let's make a movie about a woman because that's the thing to do now or something. We, we never think like that. It's just like, what, what are we interested in? What do we want to say? And this character comes up, you know? And, and then we just, we just want her to be true to life. We just want her to live. And we don't really think, okay, she, she does that because she's a woman. I mean, people aren't like that. You know, they, they do that because they're themselves to do it because they have their own interior logic. So it's their interior logic we are interested in. Mm. And, uh, and if that creates uh, a whole individual that people can relate to, that's, that's amazing. We're very happy. Let, let me add something, but it's also a question of mise-en-scene. And it's a question of how you perceive. And what I was actually quite conscious of in the film was in this day and age where it's kind of sensitive uh, discussion going on about the male gaze, uh, men's perspective in cinema, and I, I know you know it's a, it's a good point. You see, watch a random action movie, and when a woman goes through a door, you have a low shot of her behind walking into the room, and the man you see him from in front. You know all that theory. You know we've been to film school; we we're aware of it. I went to Laura Mulvey lectures when I was a kid. You know, and, and it's important. But what, what's actually was interesting was the, the liberation of being able to shoot a female perspective on sexuality. I don't want to, you know. I hope the film proves, but we talked about that that actually Herbert's ass has a close-up, and she grabs and he, she bites his ass, you know. It's, it's actually, it was easier to make something about passion and sexuality and, and the dream of meeting someone and, and, you know, being physical with them through a female perspective. It was, it was more triggering. There was more original shots to be made for me as a filmmaker. So that felt just like a gift. It wasn't, you know, something where I was very mathematical about it. It was just something that happens if you follow the character. Uh, but for, for some years, your uh, lead characters have been women, mm. both of you. It's true, actually. Yeah, yeah it's true. Yeah, even uh, I have another film here with also uh, a young girl who's the lead. Yeah, <laughs> it's a marvelous film. You should all see it on Sunday. <laughs> Maybe the is that, isn't, that... can I ask? Is that historical? Like Eskil has two films uh, in main selection. I think that's quite remarkable. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> But I intervened at question for the actors, so... Yes. Yeah. yeah. Hello. Uh, you talked about... No, no, no. Uh, there, there was working, some, uh, yeah, it's another there question. Was an, uh, question. Should I... Uh, working with Joachim was uh, amazing. I've uh, become a better actress working with him. I feel that. He gave so, so much space and trust to... Um, yeah, so much freedom to do to just be in the moment in a totally different level than I've ever worked with before. It was amazing. And also he's very smart and has great questions to, I don't know, work with when you, when you do a scene. Yeah, so maybe you guys wanna. Yeah. Well, it was a, <clears throat> a dream come true, you know, to work with the York Interior. Um, I remember I saw a rep reprise when I was 19, um, and I just, I just, uh, just blew my mind. So to work with him now is amazing, and he creates an atmosphere that's right for every single scene. So you don't have to go on set and feel like you have to cr create anything. You just uh, you're in there and reacting, and and. Um, was just, I learned, like Renat said, I learned so much. It was really like the coolest thing I've ever done. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Anders, um, you have been uh, working with uh, Joachim for, for years, since his first film. So um, how did he change, maybe? or He's gotten older. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, it's, it's almost hard for me to talk about, because I, I, we, we know each other so well. So, um, but I think that our friendship uh, is very important for our professional relationship. So you see each other, you meet each other between Absolutely. films? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, he's just the, the best uh, director in the world in many aspects. <laughs> uh, I'll leave now. Thank you. I think no, this is... Um, I'm not... No, no, but really, he's, he's one of the best uh, directors for actors in particular because he's such a great psychologist uh, uh, on set. And he also has this ability to uh, be intuitive and 
analytical at the same time. I know some directors can be afraid of analyzing too much because they are afraid that uh, some of the magic gets lost and you're not afraid of that. And um, I love you for that. <laughs> because you have to have both. And you have to believe that when you're working, you, you have to accept that the magic uh, is not always there, but it might come to life again. It's just hard work and you have to, to push the envelope every day and that's what it's all about. Would you have a specific example of, um, on the set, how he can be uh, uh, intuitive and analytical at the same time? Yeah, because sometimes uh, as an actor you prefer the director to only say things like do it faster or slower or, uh, you know, simple instructions that are easy to follow. Uh, you don't really want to go into this deep uh, character psychology discussion on set uh, or that you, you might end up confused. But I feel that uh, I think you are the only one I can do that with. Uh, whenever there's a problem and you know that this is not about simple things, this is about, this is a, a deep problem, um, we can have that, that kind of discussions uh, on set. But I remember it was a very, our way of working changed after reprise because we met uh, during the casting of reprise and when we worked together for the second time on Oslo, August 31st, um, we had, I mean, we had long conversations and discussions in, in advance, but when we started shooting, we didn't actually talk that much to each other. Because you, when you know a person very well, you can judge by the, by the facial expression, by the, by the look on their faces, what they want or what, what you have to do. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, there's um, someone who hasn't, talk yet here, and uh, she's a woman, and it's maybe important that uh, the producer of the film is a woman. Uh, how, how, can you describe your collaboration with uh, Joachim? Yes. Um, I mean, I produced together with, uh, or Thomas Robson is the main uh, producer here who has worked with Joachim several times before. Um, and is very experienced, and he is male. And this is my first feature as a producer, and I'm female uh, in the, both the target group of the audience, but also very close to the character and where she is in her life. So for me, it's such a gift to produce a film where I can actually just take everything I have from my own intuition and my own life and my own knowledge. It doesn't have to be the craft. It could be just like, yeah, from, from life experience and discuss with Eskil and Joachim from a very early stage from in the script process, which was really, really inspiring um, because they also listened so carefully. They were really, really interested in having the perspectives from everyone around, uh, as you also mentioned. But I particularly, I was just very happy that they were really keen to get the perspective of <laughs> a female in that position of the character. Uh, and they are just very warm human beings. So that's, uh, yeah, it's been a truly amazing journey. Yeah. Can I say something about that? Thank you, Andrea. And, and it's been a, such a pleasure working with you. And I, it's, it's, it's remarkable that this is your first film. Uh, I, I didn't notice. Like, your organizational and your creative efforts have just been, like, spot on all the way. Uh, but I, I also want to say, like, what, what, what I'm looking for all the time is specificity. I think all, all, everyone that works with movies, and I'm sure you journalists as well, you're looking for specificity. You don't want anything to be general. So if anyone in the team or anyone who, the actors, or like when you said, oh, I know, I have some friends who live in apartments in that part of town that look like that, and you invited us home to that apartment so we could take pictures, and the art director says, ah, oh, look at that. You know, like, to have uh, like a, a group of people making a film together and, and, and getting it specific, that's much more fun. Even if that specificity... Uh, we're allowed to come here, and, and, and for some of the films we watch here, it's exotic to us because we're from a small country in the north of Europe, and I'm sure it's the other way around, that Norway might 
look a little bit different than where many of you guys are from, but still we react to specificity, you know, in other cultures as well. So I think I think that the, we talk a lot about making, sto you know, creating stories and characters and all that, but I think the, the specificity of place and objects and and uh, vantage point and how you shoot something, you know, that's something we collaborate about as a group. And that's a that's a really important thing. Hello, uh, Stephen from Belgium. Uh, talking about relatability, uh, the breakup scene, how hard was it to write that with all the different stages, which you think in my head you got really correct? It's a question for both of you, of course, but also for Anders and uh, Renate. Uh, that was really easy to write. It was, uh, I mean, the, uh, the idea Joachim and I had was so clear that we really wanted, I mean, the scene could stop at any point and everyone would know the story, you know? It's, it's, not, it's not necessary for the plot for that scene to last that long. They break up. I mean, she could say, it's over, cut to the next thing, you know, in the movie. But we wanted the feel of a breakup. The, all those stages you, uh, that people go through when they, when they end an important relation because it's so hard. And we hadn't really seen that in a movie before and we really wanted to go deep in that, and, uh, and also that uh, idea of the, of the overlapping voiceover just came very early and felt r really right, because you, maybe because you have sort of a distance to yourself when you're in that situation, you, like, uh, like Julie, when, uh, when she compares herself to Bambi on the ice and she starts to laugh, she's outside of the situation and she comes back into it. And so it was, uh, it was a, a joy to write that scene, and they, it ended up like quite, close to how we wrote it with that great one, like great improvised moments, like the great uh, moment where, where Julie talks about uh, how Axel always wants to put words on things for them to count, which was a wonderful character moment that, uh, that Renata added, I think. But it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was lovely and it's, uh, it's one of my favorite parts of the movie when I saw it yesterday. You mean that part was not in the script, right? That that part, yeah, uh, that, uh, yeah, yeah, of, yeah. So you just did one take, or uh, of of this particular moment, well, or? No, uh, it's it's a long process. What we do is we do a lot of rehearsals, <coughs> and we discuss, and we share, and we discuss the before problems. Before the shooting. Or, yeah, before the right? shooting, and we discuss uh, personal stuff and what you know, and 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 uh, so we've written something, Eskel and I, and then we shoot a lot of rehearsals, and I go back in the room with Eskel, and we we re create and then we continue on set and something will come out of it um, and in in this case there was a piece of voiceover that you did it sort of an impro over uh, which was about Julie's need the paradox Julie, Julie feels she doesn't know herself and she's yearned for a relationship to be seen in to be defined but that definition that she seeked from the outside from Axel is obviously also imprisoning and, and, and hindrance to your sense of self and freedom and that this is the thing you know and when, when you meet someone and you're close to someone are you um, are you using them for a purpose that you don't even know about yourself you know or are you being used for a purpose and this this is you know the, the the complications of love is there such a thing as pure love I'm not sure you know there's always millions of agendas conscious and unconscious but I think you you really came up with some interesting Things there, and you can see the wonderful Casper Tuxen, the, the, the cinematographer, is kind of over in the corner, and he just like jumps over to you because something happened. Yeah, yeah, I love that you you start. Yeah, it, it's a, maybe a good way to work because we had those because we had those voiceover uh, parts in the script. There were parts where the actors' dialogue wasn't written, and we we took a decision. Usually, when we have scenes like that, I write dialogue that's not in the script for the daily pages for the actors and here we said no they have the they have the like the the keywords in the voiceover so they can just uh, improvise over that and uh, great stuff happened Renata can you comment on, on this uh, stage of rehearsal and preparing and yes uh, but uh, maybe the other I have a bit of a cold not corona but uh, and my nose is really running under here. So <laughs> <laughs> if I take my mask off, <laughs> it will be terrible. It will be. <laughs> you will all leave. Um, Maybe yeah. a, cl a bit closer to yeah. the mic. Then. <laughs> but um, what was the question? <laughs> the rehearsal process. Yes, the rehearsal process was. Um, 
yeah, it was uh, it was important for the we we were we were talking about how far should we go in the rehearsal? Should we max it out and do the scene as uh, emotional as it's as we kind of want it to be? Or should we hold it back? We had a lot of discussions on that. Like, will the spark die or will it just like keep going further? So we, I don't know, we, we tried a little bit of both, I think. What did we land on? What was the, what think, was the good thing to do? <laughs> I think that um, improvisation is a problematic tool when you uh, work with scenes and when you rehearse scenes, it, it can be excellent to refresh a scene and make it uh, spontaneous again. And also, if you know, your, you know where you're going, you kind of know the content of the, of the scene, but you don't know exactly the, the words or the, the beats. And we often compare this to jazz music it's easy to improvise if you know the, the art of improvisation. It's easy to improvise if you know the chord changes. But if you don't have any changes, if you don't have any chords, uh, you are kind of lost. And I think that sometimes I, I can sense when a dialogue is totally improvised. It, it creates some kind of weird um, uh, dynamic that doesn't feel quite right, even though it might feel right when you perform it. Um, but what the way we have been working, uh, I would say, since Oslo, is that you guys create wonderful stretches of dialogue, and then we work with them uh, during rehearsals, and 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 we kind of we have to feel what they taste like, and we have to try the the musicality. Is is this right? Could we? Is this uh, does it feel natural? And then we might add something. And then you go back and rewrite the the dialogue, but you we it feels like we always have some space left for that unknown uh, magic that might happen when you have adrenaline <laughs> pumping in your in your body. And and I think it's very very important to always stay open for something you don't know. You don't know what that is. Was that done around a table or on, on location or in the... You mean the rehearsal yeah. process? No, we had rehearsals in, uh, uh, in advance, I mean, before shooting. Yeah. So that Eskil and, and Joachim are... In the room? ...have the time. Yeah, exactly. So that they have the time to, to work on the dialogue, but, but there should always be some space left. And that's when you can... Um, uh, because you, you, because your, your brain knows where you're going, you know the content, and then that facilitates that, that uh, magic that you search for. How about? Yeah, it was, it was a really, really, um, really important to uh, work uh, so much with the scenes before we filmed. And I remember that we did a small kind of improvisation, me and Renata, and I just kind of, I didn't answer um, when I should answer, and Joachim said, thank you, and and he leaned over and he looked at me in the eyes and he said, what happened there? <laughs> so it was a very like, very focused and very, <clears throat> I felt um, it was such uh, nice to have this kind of focus on every single thing. It felt very, um, I felt like this is high quality. <laughs> <laughs> Now, uh, there's a very important character, I think, in the film, uh, which we're already familiar with because we know your previous films. It's the city. I mean, uh, did you, um, how did you choose the, the locations? And uh, did you shoot in sequence? Because there's also the change of looks uh, for the character, so it might create some you know, difficulties. And, uh, and it seems the city has changed quite a bit, or you film it differently from your from Oslo, uh, August 31st, for example? No, thank you for the question. Yeah, no, it's it's a marvelous thing to grow, grow up in a city. Again, going back to specificity and the idea that um, wanting to show a specific moment, being in that park at midnight and feeling romantic, or the light comes up in the morning in a specific street that you've experienced 
after party or something like that, and knowing that that's how June feels in those streets that you grew up in. It's, it's a real gift to be able to once in a while make a film at home, you know, with that, where you have intuition. And we can talk about it, Eskel and I. And we can, already when we're writing, we can say, ah, oh, that's an interesting, we, and we haven't done that. And I saw this way to look at a street over there the other day, and maybe that could be that scene. And, you know, so, so just the physicality of making movies, we, we, we always forget because we're, everyone, when we define films, we always talk about the pitch line, you know, like the tagline, you know, it's, what, what, what's the story and all that stuff. But really a film is also like just sequences of spaces that you need to like find a smart way uh, to cut between. Okay, so that feels like morning, and when we cut, it needs to be really clear daylight, so we see it's the next day. But if it's the ro if it's the low light evening, it could seem like it's the same morning. You know, we don't. A lot of people don't think about this. So the spatial and temporal development of sequences in your own city is something that you feel, and it's it's a gift. You know, it's it's really fun. And did you try to shoot in sequence? Yeah, no, no, we, we, we couldn't. I, again, sustaining specific light situations in scenes, you've got to go back sometimes and all that. But I think um, many, many people in this film really, really, really made a great effort to create different looks. Uh, hair and makeup and Renat and, you know, like the, the whole idea of, of seeing the development over a period of time, which is spans from your sort of mid-20s to your early 30s. Um, yeah, a lot of work. And, and, and it had to be in certain order to, f to cut her hair at a certain time and all that. So, but we didn't shoot in sequence. Um, I have, as, as a, a musical freak, I, 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 there's a very extraordinary scene in the film, which is not realistic, where everybody frees, you know, in the city and the two lovers run uh, towards one another. It, it reminded me of, of some, you know, uh, musical numbers with, with Gene Kelly or Fred Astaire, and they're dancing, and everybody around them is freezing, you know, like in a painting in American Paris. Mm. And uh, so... Uh, we, we wanted to make a musical, and we failed. We, Eskel and I was like, well, we want to do a musical. And it seems like everyone's doing musicals. We, we, we failed, sorry. But we, we still have like some sequences that have that sense of uh, musicality and physicality and, and movement, you know, that... that How did you inspired. get the idea of this film? The idea is very basic that I think, I don't know anyone, at least at my age, who haven't experienced at some point in your life that you're in a relationship that's great and you see someone or meet someone that you also really like and you wish you could stop time, run out of your reality and experience something to know what it was, you know? And I, we wanted to just take that romantic notion and, and try to make a cinematic sequence out of it. So that's it. Okay, no more questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye.